surgical templating and the implant choice in a total hip replacement. So we are all thinking surgeons. We think before uh, we decide to do anything. And uh, once we have given it a nice thought, we you know, sort of execute it. But in spite of thinking, there are some pitfalls. And then we do land up with accidents. As they say, shit happens. But we better be prepared for it. So uh, in the words of Heinz Wagner, the operating theater is a place for doing what you have planned for and not the place for planning what to do. So to restore the anatomy, there are three independently variable factors. One is the implant size. The second is the leg length and the offset. And the third is a version. Now this version is one thing which you can tentatively have a mental idea about, but you cannot really plan very operatively. But you need to have an idea about the version as well. The three things we look at is the ideal cup position. Uh, we look at the fit of the femoral uh, stem. And then there are various neck options for adjusting the biomechanics. So what these biomechanics are, are sort of encompassed in this uh, uh, you know, famous picture, which is taken you know, there in all the books. And here we are looking at basically the joint reaction forces, the vertical offset, and the horizontal offset. The horizontal offset basically is a line, is a distance between the center of the femur to the center of the femoral head. And the vertical offset is basically talking about the leg length discrepancy. By making some minor alterations and uh, adjustments in the femoral stem, in the acetabular cup placement, you can medialize the center of the head, you can lateralize the stem, you can get it up, get it down, which leads to profound implications on the overall functioning of the hip replacement and the overall functioning of the joint and the longevity of the joint. How it affects? It basically alters the hip joint mechanics. It affects the, the strength the abductors have to uh, exert while uh, during the gait phase. And uh, it also affects the patient's gait postoperatively if there is a discrepancy in the limb length, which usually is a cause of a lot of uh, sort of you know, concern. It is a cause of uh, medi medical litigations and uh, sort of a, you know, landing up with an unhappy patient. The neck shaft angle is not uh, uniform in most of the patients. We know that there are differences in the neck shaft angle, the size of the femoral head, the size of the acetabulum. There are these coxa vara, where the horizontal offset is very high. The vertical offset might not be as high. Coxa valga, and the femoral necks is in different uh, uh, in different individuals. There are different versions for uh, the normal variation as well. If you have to look at a graph of the no commonly uh, you know of the cross section of the population of the different femoral offsets, you can see the majority of the patients are having a particular femoral offset. But there are some patients who come to us who are having who are sort of the outliers. So the, in these, it is in them that we need to pick up these uh, problems, we need to pick up these patients and then plan for them. We need to know all these things preoperatively and so that we can preempt and we can sort of predict any particular problems and this is why the preoperative planning comes in handy. Of tissue balancing, this is uh, basically restoring the abductor lever arm. So nowadays the modern day processes give you a lateral offset stem or a, mid or a sort of a standard offset stem which gives you the opportunity within you know, keeping the same fit in the femoral canal to adjust the abductor lever arm to improve the hip biomechanics, to lateralize the femoral shaft thereby increasing the abductor tension and therefore you can reduce the femoropelvic impingement and also give a better range of movement, a better stability to the joint. This is an example of the taper lock stem. You have a standard offset, and then you have a lateralized offset. So if you see that the, the distal geometry or the geometry of the stem that goes inside the femoral canal is the same, but the center of the head is then medialized just by using a lateral uh, offset stem, or basically you are increasing the lateral offset by making minor alterations in the vertical offset or the vertical distance. Similarly, the leg length can be adjusted by adjusting the level of the resection or the level of the prosthesis. Now, this is an example of the exeter stem with the cemented mantle. So if you see, if you have planned that, you know, there are the, these laser markings that are there on the stem, the similar laser markings are there on the preoperative template that is provided to you. So by sinking in the stem, by keeping it proud, by making some minor alterations, you can adjust the vertical offset. Modern day prosthesis give you a wide range of options uh, depending on the size of the stem, the horizontal offset, the vertical offset, the different neck lengths, the modularity, which enables you to perform the hip replacement to your choice or to mimic the patient's anatomy. So if you just consider these uh, exeter stems, I think we do not have the 50 si size 50 stem in India, but I think from 30 to 44, everything is available on the shelf. Coming to the templating technique, so basically, it has to be a uh, we template on a pelvis with both the hips, and um, 
It has to be a standardized X-ray. It has to be a square pelvis. The legs to be rotated internally, about 15 degrees. The legs have to be rotated internally in the same uh, sort of angle because if it is not rotated in internally, then it can have its implications on uh, the next shaft angle, which would sort of you know offset you or uh, sort of mislead you in uh, calculating the vertical or the horizontal offset. Always template the acetabulum first. So basically here in this diagram, it is just shown the difference in the leg length. It is not much, it's about three millimeters. So we template the acetabulum first. This is a template of a, a resurfacing, but just focus on the acetabulum here. So the acetabulum is matched at the teardrop. We calculate the center of the femoral, uh, center of the uh, center of the hip. So that basically is your starting point. Um, so the important landmarks here are the teardrop, the medial wall. So that will give you an idea as to how much bone do you have medially, how much deep can you keep on reaming. And the acetabular cup ideally is placed at an angle of 45 degrees. Now once you are at the teardrop and you decide to angulate the cup at about 45 degrees, then normally most of the most of the hips, they would have a good superior lateral coverage. But a lot of hips are dysplastic, they have a shallow acetabulum, they have a sort of a big center edge angle, uh, sort of a narrow center edge angle, the hip is sort of extruded, or there's a big medial osteophyte. So which would mean that, you know, your cup would be uh, uh, uncovered superior laterally. So if you have preempted these problems, then intraoperatively, it does not become a big problem. Or if it is uncovered to a large extent, then you can decide if there is bone medially, you can ream more medially, you can medialize the head and you can adjust the hip center as per your convenience. Coming to the femoral uh, side, the femoral side, you, there are two aspects to the femoral uh, templating. One is the fit of the stem inside the, femoral, inside the canal. So that is planned on an AP and a lateral X-ray. And part outside the canal basically deals with the hip biomechanics. So here you can decide about the horizontal offset and you can decide about the vertical offset. So similarly, we know that we have a three millimeter shortening that is the center of the head. There is a line, these are the small fine lines. I, I don't know if you can see them and appreciate them, but all the templates would have fine lines where they would uh, mark whether it's three, uh, minus three, minus four, or plus three, plus four, plus eight, or whatever uh, sizes. Depending on that, wherever the template sits, you can calculate the angle of the neck resection or the level of the neck resection and mentally map it as to how high are you going to go from the lesser trochanter. And once that is done, you can sort of you know, execute your joint replacement. Now, it, doesn't, I, it is not going to say that you know, these are the exact sizes that you have planned. And if you plan for a size, uh, you know, let's say a 52, you are going to implant a 52. Sometimes there is a variation of one size plus minus. But across all the publications, what they have said is there is always a variation of one size plus minus. But at least it gives you an idea that you are not grossly off the plan that you had planned. You, uh, we are getting these uh, electronic softwares to uh, plan. One of them is OrthoView. Now, OrthoView is not open for the Indian market, but online, if you can uh, request, you can just write an email to them. It's a free software. Uh, there are some free hi hips that they let you do it, but uh, it's for sale in the US, but we don't get it here for the Indian users on the Indian ISP. But uh, they have got templates of all the companies that you would want to use, Depu, Biomed, Zimmer, Witcher, Stem, Cup, Processes, Combination. All you have to do is upload the X-ray on the packs, and then they, you can use their software, and you can plan. This is just another example. I have borrowed it from a friend where they are using the OrthoView software. And uh, there they have planned for the Exeter uh, stem. You can see that the cup is placed at the teardrop. It has got a superior lateral coverage. They have medialized the cup enough. They have planned for an Exeter, probably the size uh, one, uh, whatever offset. And they have performed the surgery and it is sort of, you know, as per the surgical plan preoperatively. What, however, we can do to use electronic templating is that if there are any Mac users, you can use this Osirix uh, software, which uh, helps you to, uh, you know, sort of, uh, draw your own lines, draw your own angles. You can sort of, you know, uh, template, size the acetabulum, size the, uh, the femoral head. And it gives you a sort of a roadmap or an idea about where your implants are going to lie and what, are, uh, what is going to happen. But in spite of these, we occasionally come across a hip, we occasionally come across a patient where all, in spite of, you know, all the radiological parameters, very difficult to plan a particular patient. Now, for example, this, in case of this uh, obese, uh, patient and, for, and he's a doctor so in him it's very difficult to say where the hip is lying what sort of relation the true acetabulum has to the false acetabulum that he has formed he's a gentleman who is a doctor who is a practicing gynecologist he is 
has a childhood uh, infective septic arthritis and has led, you know sort of landed with um, uh, multi he had multiple osteomyelitis across all the joints he has a dysplastic ape on the other side and he's walking with the equinus gait so he's become painful now he come for surgery the other thing that you can use which uh, dr vaibhav bagadia is doing very uh, frequently or very you know is more experienced than us is you can get it 3d printed so uh, just based on a ct scan if you are finding it difficult to see where the exact uh, uh, you know uh, a true acetabulum is how deep can you go in how lateralized or how medialized can you go you can get these models 3d printed now they are available uh, in the city of bombay at a very short notice in a you know, two days you can get those models so we had these models 3d printed and uh, as expected what we had we had expected that even the smallest size prosthesis or the ddh stem we would not be able to negotiate which was what we found so we sort of did a trial or a mock you know uh, surgery as a part of the preoperative planning to see if the smallest size acetabular component will go in and uh, fortunately as we had thought that you know we were able to get a decent size acetabulum inside we planned it and then we could predict what was the extent of the superior coverage or uncoverage that we would expect at the time of surgery and once we had done that we could see that you know uh, we could accommodate for a 22 or a 28 sized head we performed the surgery there were a few uh, difficulties anticipated we encountered those uh, difficulties there was a periprosthetic fracture but because we had done the pre-op planning we had done the homework this surgery could be executed without any uh, uh, you know gross uh, problems or any problems post operatively coming to the post coming to the uh, the second part of the topic the choice of the fib choice of the implant i mean you just briefly go through the advantage of cemented hips uh, cemented hips give the advantage of a good initial fixation a better restoration of anatomy in terms of the leg leg length offset and version it has got lower dislocation rate rates across all the uh, studies which are being published or across all the joint registry data and it has got an outstanding survivorship which currently uh is sort of you know unparalleled uh, uncemented stems or cementless stems are not necessarily technically easier they might be technically difficult they have a higher incidence of limb length discrepancy they have a higher incidence of periprosthetic fractures and thigh pain and there is a higher chance of medical negligence litigation in if you have done an uncemented prosthesis this is again as per the literature and as per the joint uh, uh, registries there is a significantly higher risk in the initial post op period of revision with uncemented implants within the first uh, few days after the surgery but they have their own advantages they are more biological less bone loss they offer you modularity we can use whatever liners we want we can use uh, constrained liners uh, highly cross linked liners and there is a lot of modularity uh, that the surgeon uh, gets when he uses uncemented hips as compared to the cemented this is just a brief snapshot of the national joint registry data which is uh, from england and wales this is i think the 2014 and what you can see here the the graph in the 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 line diagram in the purple is a cemented hip replacement so cemented hip replacement you can see that from uh, 2006 to 2013 it is still high but the popularity is slowly slowly going down and in the blue the next line is a cementless which is going up so in 2013 uh, it had a 42% market share as compared to a 37% market share of the cemented hip replacements hybrids are also becoming more popular so from 2003 to 2013 there have been a, there has been a growth from 14% to 23% in terms of the hybrid hip replacements but resurfacings and the metal on metal is still low and it is going out of popularity Yeah. Uh, in terms of the bearing surfaces, the metal on poly continues to be the most popular choice. However, you can see that the ceramic on poly is slowly, slowly gaining popularity, which is the graph in the left. So, in 2015, it has uh, the numbers have really picked up. So, the search for the bearing surfaces continues. So, metal on metal bearings they had a catastrophic failure. Metal on polyethylene continues to be the most popular, and ceramic on pop uh, uh, poly is currently being the most uh, uh, you know upcoming or the fastest growing the thing whatever is the case there is a higher risk of revision in patients who are young in patients who are less than 55 years as compared to the patients who are more than 75 years so whatever your choice of prosthesis whatever your choice of implant just be sure that your younger patient needs one definitive operation and the surgeon has just got one chance to get her home thank you thank you dr farnis uh, we'll have the discussions at the